The new Act has introduced a number of new company types. For our private limited companies, there will be two new types. The first one will be the company limited by shares, and the second one will be the designated activity company. The designated activity company will be in particular for companies that are limited by shares or companies limited by guarantee which have a share capital. This form of company will have a constitution which will be similar in form to the old form memorandum and articles of association and it will still have an objects clause. The new limited company will have a new type constitution which will replace the memorandum and articles of association and it will also dispense with the need for an objects clause and thereby removing the, the ultra vires rule. The, this type of company will also have one director as opposed to the designated activity company which will have two directors. For the other types of companies, the public limited company, the company limited by guarantee and the unlimited companies, these will remain substantially the same. However, they will replace their memorandum and articles of association with a new form of constitution which will be in two parts similar to the Memorandum and Articles of Association that we know. However, they can also now become single member companies, which is different. The conversion process will be relatively straightforward. From commencement, each company will have 18 months to decide which company type they want to convert to. So the cur current form limited company can convert to either a DAC or a limited company by a resolution of their shareholders. So what will happen in fact is the directors will decide which company type is best suited to their business and the members then will pass an ordinary resolution which will be then filed with the company's registration office with their new form constitution. This then will convert the company to the new company type. Um, following the filing of this resolution, the company's registration office will issue a new certificate of incorporation and this will have the new designations such as DAC, PLC, unlimited company or whichever type the company is converted to. It should be noted that if a company fails to convert during the transition period, they will automatically be converted to a limited company at the end of that period. And during the period of transition, the law applying to designated activity companies will apply. Directors' duties under the Companies Acts remain substantially the same, however there have been some changes. The main one being that fiduciary duties for the first time are now codified under the Companies Act and this naturally brings more onerous duties to directors. In addition, directors are now required to ensure that the company secretary has the necessary skills to discharge their duties or that they have the financial resources to do so. Another change includes the directors being required to have a compliance statement within their financial statements and this would be not normally in the director's report. This section applies to companies that are large private companies or public limited companies but do not apply to unlimited companies. Directors' interests have also changed under the new Companies Acts. Directors are required to disclose their interests where they exceed 1% and this will reduce or eliminate many of the disclosures currently required. The new Companies Act introduces changes to the audit ex exemption regime and for the first time certain new companies can avail of the audit exemption such as companies limited by guarantee, however if companies limited by guarantee are also registered as a charity they cannot avail of the audit exemption. Groups of companies which formerly were not able to avail of the audit exemption can now do so, however Taken together, the whole group must satisfy the criteria for a small company and in this case they can avail of the audit exemption. It should be noted however that the audit exemption changes will apply to financial years after the 1st of June 2015. In addition, companies will have to satisfy two out of the three criteria in relation to being a small company to avail of the audit exemption and this is different to the past where they had to satisfy all three criteria. Looking first at private companies, if a company is a limited company under the new regime and has a single member or a multi-member, they can choose to dispense with the annual general meeting. 
and this is very simple in that they will just pass a member's written resolution dispensing with the AGM. For a designated activity company, if it is a single member company, it can dispense with the annual general meeting. However, if it's a multi-member company, it will still continue to hold its AGM. For other company types, such as public companies, companies limited by guarantee, unlimited companies, these types of companies, if they're a single member company, can now for the first time dispense with annual general meetings. However, if they're multi-member companies, they must continue to hold their AGMs. The summary approval procedure now effectively standardises whitewash procedures that were previously available. It can be used to validate seven activities, financial assistance, reduction of share capital, capital variation on a reorganisation, the treatment of pre-acquisition profits, prohibition of loans to directors, mergers and a member's voluntary winding up. The summary approval procedure can be used by private companies limited by shares, designated activity companies, companies limited by guarantee and unlimited companies. Public limited companies can only use the procedure in limited circumstances. A private company that is a subsidiary of a public limited company cannot utilise the procedure to approve financial assistance for the acquisition of shares in a parent PLC. Three types of domestic merger are now available. They are merger by absorption, merger by acquisition, and merger by formation of a new company. The directors will need to prepare common draft terms of merger. There are some exceptions, but an expert's report would be required, and the merger will need to be approved by the members of each company. This is a process whereby an existing company acquires all the assets and liabilities from one or more companies in exchange for the allotment of shares to the members of the transferor companies. This can be with or without cash payment. The transferor companies are then dissolved without going into liquidation. This is a process whereby a wholly owned subsidiary transfers its assets and liabilities to its holding company. As a result of this process, the transferor company can be dissolved without going into liquidation. This is a process whereby one or more transferor companies transfer their assets and liabilities to a newly formed company in exchange for the allotment of shares to the members of the transferor companies. Again, as a result of this process, the transferor companies can be dissolved without going into liquidation. Quite radically, in the case of the vast majority of Irish companies, private companies limited by shares will no longer have objects clauses and therefore the doctrine of ultraviaries will not apply to those companies and if they act outside of those objects then their acts will be unenforceable. However, when dealing with such companies, particularly in the context of bank finance, a lender would be extremely well advised to have its lawyers look at the articles of association of those companies to ensure that any restrictions on the director's abilities to borrow are not exceeded. Not quite. It's abolished in the context of private companies limited by shares, but it still has significance for other types of vehicles. So for example, designated activity companies, which are new creations of the Act, will continue to have objects clauses which need to be reviewed and their activities will need to be consistent with those objects clauses. The same applies for other types of entities such as guarantee companies, PLCs and unlimited companies. However, for the first time, 
there is in the Act a provision whereby the shareholders can retrospectively approve ultra vires acts by those entities. Not really. Irish companies are still obliged to have seals and the seal must only be affixed with the approval of a board meeting or a meeting of a committee of directors. However, the Act has introduced a little bit more flexibility in relation to the identities of the person who can witness the affixing of the seal. So for the first time, it is not necessarily the case that a director needs to witness the affixation of the seal. No, not at all. Um, when taking security over shares, a lender's counsel will need to review the articles of association of the company to examine whether the veto is contained in the articles of association. And if the directors do retain the ability to refuse to register a transfer, then the bank would be extremely well advised to ensure that it is removed. And that can be done by virtue of the passing of a special resolution of the shareholders. Yes, they will. The Act prohibits the giving of financial assistance by an Irish company for the purpose of the acquisition of shares in itself or in any of its holding companies. Um, while there have been some refinements with the new legislation, the broad prohibition still remains. Certain of the refinements include certain favourable aspects. So the reference to the financial assistance being in connection with the acquisition of shares has now been removed, which is welcomed given the wide nature of that terminology. Equally, certain exceptions have been tidied up. So the refinancing exception, which was contained in the previous Act, has now been refined so that guarantees which are given on the refinancing, provided the original guarantees have been subject to a previous validation procedure, will no longer need to be whitewashed. Yes, you do. Irish companies are still obliged to file when they create security. And if they create charges or mortgages over any class of assets, then they are obliged to submit particulars within the prescribed timeframes. The exclusions to this relate to certain asset classes, including shares, cash, and accounts. The novelty in the new Act is that it, for the first time it gives you an option in relation to the registration process. You can continue to file particulars within 21 days of creation, but the alternative now, and in order to protect priority, the lender is permitted to avail of a two-step process. The first part of that process would entail giving the company's registration office advance notice of the creation of the charge and then following up, following the creation of the charge with a subsequent filing. The 2014 Act consolidates all existing companies Act stretching back over a 50 year period into one single Act. In consolidated in one place, access to the relevant law has been greatly simplified. In Ireland, approximately 90% of companies are private companies limited by shares. The Act, in making it the new model company, places the private company limited by shares at centre stage. The first 15 parts of the Act sets out the law governing the private company limited by shares. Then, parts 16 to 19 sets out the law governing other company types, such as designated activity companies in part 16, public companies in part 17, guaranteed companies in part 18, and unlimited companies in part 19. The main change is that the new private company limited by shares will have a single constitution and will have the same legal capacity as a natural person. This will allow it unlimited capacity to carry on any business activity. 
The effect of this is to abolish the doctrine of ultra-virus for private company limited by shares. However, the capacity of other companies, such as designated activity companies and guarantee companies, would continue to be dependent on its object clauses. For the first time under Irish law, the merger of Irish companies would be permitted. Previously, a merger involving Irish companies would only have been possible under Irish law if there was an EEA cross-border element. The 2014 Act is expected to come into effect in June 2015. The existing legislation on receivers has largely been reproduced in the 2014 Act, including the, the duty on receivers to get the best available price for the asset currently available. The one significant change is in relation to the powers of receivers. Now, traditionally, the powers of receivers have been dealt with in the mortgage or the debenture document itself. And there has been some difficulties in case law in terms of the powers are not always adequate for what's required. So the new Act updates the powers of receivers and essentially allows receivers to do anything that's necessary or convenient for the attainment of his objectives as a receiver. They are. A scheme of arrangement is an arrangement between a company and its creditors in relation to debts owing by the company. It requires a 75% majority of the creditors. The new Act simplifies the process. Instead of there being three court applications, there is only now one court application necessary because, in the first instance, the original meeting of creditors can be convened now by the directors. There is no court application needed. Secondly, the advertisement of the creditors' meeting is set down now. It must be done with two daily newspapers and therefore there's no need to apply to court for directions as to how it is to be advertised. So there's only one court application now necessary, which is for the approval and the sanction of the court for the scheme of arrangement. This hasn't changed significantly in the new Act. There are still three main forms of winding up. The first is the creditors winding up, which is an insolvent liquidation. The second is a member's winding up, which is a solvent liquidation. And the third is a court-ordered winding up. So this hasn't changed in the new Act. The most significant change in the new Act in relation to windings up is that liquidators now must qualify. And in order to qualify, they must be either an accountant or a solicitor or a member of another professional body approved by the Irish Accounting Board. The legislation in relation to examinerships is largely restated in the 2014 Act. So therefore, in order to obtain protection, you must, as a company, have a reasonable prospect of survival. You will then get a period of 100 days protection in order to reach arrangements with your creditors. One change is that you must qualify as an examiner in the same way that a liquidator now must be a qualified person to act in a winding up. So therefore, you must be either a, an accountant or a solicitor or a member of an approved professional body. The 2014 Act strengthens and extends the range of offences and penalties. So offences are now categorised as to one to four, the category one offence being the most serious. So for example, the offence of fraudulent trading now carries a potential penalty of 500,000 euros and or a term of imprisonment of up to 10 years.